Welcome everybody to Fusion Church, where we worship together both here in the sanctuary and from near and far over Zoom. But wherever we are, we are together as one body of Christ. I invite you now to join me in the prayer of invocation that is written in your bulletin. O holy God, open unto me light for my darkness, courage for my fear. O loving God, open unto me wisdom for my confusion, forgiveness for my sins. O God of peace, open unto me peace for my turmoil, joy for my sorrow. O generous God, open my heart. Amen. today's opening scripture, I invite Noah to read for us. Deal bountifully with your servant, so that I may live and observe your word. Open my eyes so that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Thank you, Noah, and good luck at school. Do well, study hard. This time, I invite uh, Dexter to come back. Go ahead. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Sit, sit, sit. So for the for the scripture reading for this morning that Noah read us, um, he said that there are many wonderful things in the world that God has given us. And I was thinking about all the wonderful things that there are in the world, and I was wondering what do you do if you don't know what some of those wonderful things are? How do you find out what the wonderful things in the world are? Because there's some things in the world that aren't so nice and you want to kind of stay away from them. 
but you want to know about those wonderful things. So I am going to, uh, I have here one wonderful thing and one not so wonderful thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh no, my wonderful thing spilled. Okay, you don't see that. We'll clean that up later. Okay, so what I have here, what's left of it, is milk, okay? Wonderful, wonderful milk. And what I have here, this one I thought to tape, I didn't think to tape the milk. This is balsamic vinegar with a little extra white vinegar thrown in just for fun. Okay, so now which of these do you think the Dexter will think is wonderful? Do you think he'll think the milk is wonderful? Raise your hand if you think he'll think the milk is wonderful. Who thinks he'll think the balsamic vinegar with a lot of extra vinegar is wonderful? Nobody? Well, we're going to see. Okay, you can't look yet. You're cheating. Okay, I have a way of letting him know which is the wonderful thing. I have two signs. This one says, delicious. So yummy, right? So we're going to mark that one with the sign. Delicious. So yummy. And this one says, Horrible tasting, yucky. Stop cheating, stop cheating there. Okay, so Dexter, what do you think? You think this one is good? Or you think this one is good? So if I just show him the sign, do you think he'll be able to figure out which is right? How many people think that he can just read the sign and figure out which one is the right one? He's smart, not that smart. Okay, so reading isn't going to work for him to figure out what the wonderful things in the world are. So another way of sit. You better wait. Another way is for me to tell him which is wonderful. So I'm going to say, you know, Dexter, this morning I had this on my cereal, and let me tell you, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. This one. Oh, it tasted terrible. I tried it and, I, you know, I wanted to throw up. It was so terrible. <laughs> He's listening very carefully, isn't he? He's listening to my story. Okay, now having told him those stories, do you think he'll be able to choose which one is the wonderful one, Dexter? The one that I told you the wonderful story about how good it tasted over there or the one about how terrible it tasted over here? Okay, is that going to work? Do you think he'll be able to choose based on my story? No. How does a dog know which is wonderful and which is terrible? He's already trying to do this. We're going to make a mess up here. Just <laughs> Okay. What do you think of this one, Dexter? Dexter, what do you think of this? Ooh, ooh. You want some more? You want some more? <laughs> Uh-uh. So he smelled it and he was like, yeah, maybe. And he tasted it. And what did he think? Nope. Doesn't even want to look at it again. What about this one? Okay. We could be here a while. So how does a dog know what's wonderful and what's not so wonderful? Yeah. Okay. That's <laughs> a dog can't read. A dog doesn't understand stories, so a dog has to experience for himself what is wonderful and what's, what's not so wonderful. He has to experience it for himself. Now, in the Bible, Jesus was talking with a lot of people and trying to explain to them what was wonderful in the world, and a lot of those people, just like Dexter, couldn't read. Some of the people could read, and so they had the scriptures, and they learned about God through those scriptures because they could read, but a lot of them couldn't read. So what did Jesus do? He told stories. And th through those stories, they learned about what was wonderful and what was not wonderful. They didn't have to experience it themselves. The point of Jesus' teaching, the things that Jesus showed people, the stories he told, helped them to understand the world and to know what was wonderful out there without them having to experience it themselves. That's a really important thing for us to remember. 
because sometimes we act like we're not going to understand somebody else's experience unless we experience it ourselves. We're not going to care about somebody else's suffering unless we ourselves have experienced that same suffering. We're not going to worry about people who are hungry if we're not hungry ourselves. We have to experience it ourselves to care. When we do that, who are we acting like? I love my dog, but I'm not a dog. And I shouldn't look at the world like a dog looks at the world. Jesus expected more of us. Jesus expected us to be able to read the Bible, to listen to his stories, and to understand other people's experience without our having to experience it ourselves. So let's say a prayer. God, we thank you that you have given us the ability to see the world through your eyes and through the eyes of others so that we can understand other people's pain, understand other people's joy, and see the wonderful things that you have given us without having to experience them for ourselves. Hear us now as we open our mouths to say together the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, where am I going to put this that you're not going to try and drink it? And a two and three and one and a two and three and
I hope that everything stayed, there we go, I hope everything stayed on uh, for Zoomers because both John and I abandoned our posts. So all you out there, was that okay? No. Did you see it? Okay. <laughs> I, oh, it was pointed at the ceiling? <laughs> Could you hear it though? Could you hear it? Okay. <laughs> I do have a few announcements. Um, first of all, I invite you all to stay after the service. We're going to have a virtual pet show where people on Zoom get to uh, introduce us to the pets that have been attending church with them all of these months. Um, and also following that, I'll have a short game show based on pets. So, uh, you know, I don't think the whole thing is going to be real long, maybe half an hour, but I invite you to stay for that time of fellowship. A few other announcements. First of all, congratulations to Hart House. They were awarded $5,000 from the Siemens Foundation. And for those who aren't aware, that was uh, they had a, a place that you could go to and click on every day to say that you supported them. And we, I don't know how many clicks in the end there were, but uh, over 40,000 40, clicks. And I think like 30,000 were from the church. So uh, thank you everybody for clicking. It was, it was tough, but you clicked, so our congratulations to the Hart House. Uh, the tax statements are available now. If you would like a statement of your donation for tax purposes, notify Joan Bowden. Her email is joan underscore, I guess that's underline, bowden at yahoo.com. And she wants to remind you all to write 2021 on your checks and not 2020. Uh, we are in the process of cleaning the church center, we are discarding all the VHS material since a lot of us don't use videos anymore. So we have an extensive collection of veggie tales, other items for young people. There also are some biblical study materials for adults that are available on VHS. There are also blank CDs, extra jewel cases available. All of those are on a card table in the foyer of the church center. And first come, first serve, come on down. Alana's is in the office from 1 to 4 on Wednesdays and Thursdays, so you can just stop by and take anything you wish. And the mission of the month, you have two more weeks, uh, two more Sundays for this month. The mission of the month is the mission of your choice. We've been getting some emails from people about the, the different organizations that they have donated to, and it's really interesting to see all of the different places that our congregation supports. So, Go ahead and give a donation to whatever you'd like to, but then let us know so that we can put that in the February newsletter. Um, are there other announcements before we look at prayer concerns? Let me get you on gallery here. At this time, then, I'm going to pause the recording. I invite you now to join in prayer when I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond to our prayer. Let us pray. God of loving kindness, patient, merciful, abounding in steadfast love, we who are your children come to you for guidance and help. When the challenges of our lives threaten to fill us with doubt and despair, may we remember that nothing can remove your love from us. You want to bring us comfort and strength. You want to give us guidance. And you have promised that you can put within our hearts a spirit of wisdom and peace. May we take hold of that promise, trusting in that promise, even in the bleakest of days, so that it may work upon our hearts until we are renewed in hope. Lord, in your mercy. We pray as we have been praying all year for those afflicted by and impacted by COVID-19. As our nation reached the terrible milestone of 400,000 deaths, we pray for all of those who are mourning the loss of a loved one, for those who are sick, for essential workers and healthcare professionals, for business owners, for all who have lost jobs, for parents and school children, for college students and professors returning to their classes. May we be patient with one another and focus on how we can help each other in this moment so that your compassion may be shared where it is most needed. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who live each day with injustice, and we pray for those who work to right the wrongs that have been visited upon others due to skin color, sexual orientation, gender, or any of the other bigotries that are too easily perpetuated through fear and ignorance. May our own mouths 
withhold hurtful words and judgments, and instead be generous in our expressions of love, openness, and compassion. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in our congregation who are facing health challenges or difficult relationships, that they may know healing, both physically and spiritually. We pray for Ding Jiashi, that he may have strength and persevere in his imprisonment until he is free. We pray for those who are trying to make hard decisions about their future, that they may have wisdom and the confidence to move forward. And we offer prayers of gratitude for those who have given so much to help us and others, those who call the lonely, who reach out to the suffering, who gather food for the hungry, and who know how to laugh and find joy in the worst of times, to lift our darkness and share with us light. We are thankful for those who are strong in spirit and ask that you help us to remain strong in spirit as well. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray finally, as we do every week, for ourselves, that we may have patience with one another in these stressful times, that we may look for opportunities to create beauty, to spread joy and hope, that we may work for the common good, be steadfast in love, walk steadfastly in faith, and always cultivate peace. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, accept these prayers as a sign of our desire to be at one with you and at one with each other, living out our lives in peace and compassion as Christ would called us to live. In his name we pray. Amen. God tells us over and over in the Bible not to be afraid. And so we dedicate ourselves to demonstrating our trust in God's promise to give us the strength we need for this day. In this quiet time of commitment, let us consider how we might offer ourselves and the blessings we have received to care for others and to show our gratitude to God. God of mercy, redemption, and grace. This morning, we dedicate ourselves once again 
to your work of love and healing in the world. In our giving, may we grow in gratitude, trust, and faithfulness. In the name of Christ, who gave all for us, we pray. Amen. Please join me now in the responsive reading from Psalm 66. Shout to God all the earth. Sing the glory of God's name. Give glorious praise. Come and see the works of God. God's deeds on our behalf are wonders. God turned the sea into dry land. And people passed through the river on foot. There, we rejoiced in God, whose reign of power lasts forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Don't exalt themselves before God. Bless God, all you peoples. Let the sound of God's praise be heard. God has kept us among the living. And has not let our feet. Before I read you today's scripture, I want to give you a little biblical background, so put on your student hats. Today's scripture concerns the call of Jesus' disciples, but it's probably not the story that comes to mind when you think of that event. Most of us think of the story in which Jesus comes to Peter, Andrew, James, and John, who are fishing, and he says to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, or people, to be more inclusive. That familiar story is the way that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke relate Jesus' call of the disciples. And I'm going to preach on that story next week. But the Gospel of John relates the disciples' call very differently. And the story of the disciples' call is not the only place in which John is very different from the other three Gospels. Scholars say that it's likely that the Gospel of Mark was the very first gospel written about 40 years after Jesus' ministry, and that when Matthew and Luke sat down to write their gospel accounts for their communities, they had a copy of Mark in front of them, which is why those three gospels are very similar. The author of the Gospel of John, however, while he drew on a lot of the same traditions that had been circulating among Christians for several decades, apparently didn't have the gospel of Mark right in front of him as he wrote. And so his wording and the details of the stories that he relates are different from those found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In addition, the author of John loved symbolism and wordplay, and he wove metaphors throughout his gospel, giving some of the stories that may have been in Matthew, Mark, and Luke layers of meaning not found in those gospels. We see that in today's passage in the author's use of an unnamed disciple who appears throughout John's gospel and is referred to only as the one Jesus loved. Commentators have speculated on who this unnamed disciple was, but some have argued that the unnamed disciple represents the reader, you and me. The scholar Martin Smith writes, perhaps the disciple is never named so that we can more easily accept that he bears witness to an intimacy with Christ that is meant for each one of us. This unnamed disciple, the one the gospel says Jesus loved, the one who is possibly in the gospel on our behalf so that we might experience the intimacy of Christ's ministry through his eyes, is the first disciple in the gospel of John to be called to ministry with Jesus. So now I want you to listen to John's account of the call of the disciples. And I want you to see yourself in this story. The next day, John, was, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and as he, walked Jesus, as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, 
where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. And he brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So two of John the Baptist's followers are hanging out with him when Jesus walks by. John the Baptist says to them, pointing at Jesus, look, here is the Lamb of God, which was for John the Baptist a poor marketing move because no sooner are the words out of his mouth than his two followers abandon him and take off after Jesus. Jesus hears them tagging along behind and he turns to them to ask, what are you looking for? What a question. What are you looking for? Why are you here? Why are you chasing after Jesus? What do you hope to find in him? What are you looking for? The two men are taken aback by this question and perhaps not ready to plumb the depth of their spiritual need. They respond in stuttering embarrassment. You know, we were just wondering where you were staying. Jesus smiles and he says, come and see. Nothing Jesus says in the Gospel of John is straightforward. Not his question, what are you looking for? Nor his summons to come and see. In those three words, Jesus offers an invitation not to check out the rooms at the local inn, but to come and see a new way of being, a new way of living. What are you looking for? Well, come and see. Come and see what I am all about, Jesus says. I have come to bring light in the darkness, to open the eyes of the blind, to illuminate the world with my truth. Come and see and discover new life in the seeing. In those three words, the author of the Gospel of John sets up the theme for everything that follows. Jesus' call in the Gospel of John is a call to a new way of seeing. And the first to receive that call are Andrew and another man who is never named. And by remaining anonymous, the author of the gospel invites us to imagine that we're that disciple, that we're called to walk with Jesus and see the world as he sees it. And from that first day, Jesus shows his disciples and shows us a life full of possibility. Jesus changes ordinary water into deep-bodied wine. He heals the sick. He helps the paralyzed to stand. He feeds 5,000 people with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. He shows his disciples the remarkable power of God's love, and his disciples are captivated. They have never seen such things. They have never thought that such life was possible. And so they declare their loyalty to Jesus, and more men and women begin to follow him. And the number of disciples increases. The crowds flock to him, because who doesn't want a life full of miracle and wine. Jesus is a hit. Everyone wants this life he promises. And then things take a dark turn. Now when Jesus says, come and see, he takes the disciples not to parties where the wine is flowing, but into the cesspool of human society. He walks up to a man whose leprosy has rotted away his face and his limbs. And as the disciples wince and discuss, Jesus reaches out to touch that diseased hand. Come and see, he calls, and he strides into the street where prostitutes are selling their bodies to survive. Where tax collectors cheat the people because they were cheated first by corrupt government officials. And the disciples want to push these sinners and these thieves away. But Jesus welcomes them into his company as friends. Come and see. 
Come and see, he calls to his disciples, to us. Anyway, it walks all the way to Golgotha, where the cruelty of the state and the pride of the religious authorities drive nails into his hands and his feet in brutal execution. We don't want to see this, the disciples cry out. And they run away in terror and grief. They were excited to hear the good news as long as it was all good for them. As long as the world Jesus was showing them was a rosy pink world of daisies and sunshine. But when Jesus opened their eyes to the ugliness of the human heart, they turned away. There was only one disciple who stayed through the end, the Gospel of John says. Who is it? The disciple without a name. The disciple who is you. Will you be that unnamed disciple? Will you stay with Jesus even when he calls you to open your eyes to the ugliness of the human heart, to the grief and the pain of human cruelty? Or will you cry out with the others, why do I have to see this? And then abandon the one who's promised you salvation. Why do we have to see it? Why can't we follow a gospel that is all reward and no cost? You know, why can't we spend the church budget on gilded roofs and ignore the poor clamoring at the door? Why doesn't the minister... Just preach about heavenly rewards in the sweet by and by so that we can block out the sounds of suffering in the bitter here and now. Why did Jesus, why does Jesus force us to open our eyes to the ugliness and the pain of the world that we would really rather not see? Let me tell you a story about the cost and about the promise of having our eyes opened. Many, many years ago, when my niece Naomi was in first grade, she's 25 now, when my niece Naomi was in first grade, my sister Wendy got a call from Naomi's teacher. I just wanted you to know that Naomi had a very rough day today, the teacher told Wendy. In preparation for Martin Luther King Jr. Day next week, I told the kids the story of Dr. King's life. And after the lesson, we all went on to the next activity, but I noticed that Naomi wasn't cranning with the other children. She was sitting silently at her desk, tears rolling down her cheeks. When I asked Naomi what was wrong, she looked up at me and she said, I'm sad because they killed Dr. King. Until that moment, Naomi's world was that of a typical six-year-old, safe and sheltered by the love of her family, where the worst thing that ever happened was discovering that there would be broccoli at dinner. Death was a new thought. Hatred, unheard of. Naomi's teacher warned Wendy that there would be more lessons to go, and sure enough, as Naomi learned about the civil rights movements of the 60s, her sheltered world was rocked. On Tuesday, she came home in bewilderment to say to her mother and father, did you know they used to make black people sit in the back of the bus and they weren't allowed to drink from the same drinking fountains as white people? And on Wednesday, she reported with amazement that restaurant owners had once prohibited people of color from sitting at their tables. And then on Thursday, the cruelty of segregation which had baffled Naomi struck her with power and cruel intent as she heard the story of Ruby Bridges. Ruby Bridges was the little African-American girl who had dared to walk before a raging crowd of white protesters to integrate the elementary school. And Ruby went right to Naomi's heart as she heard of how that brave six-year-old a little girl the same age as she was had to endure the flashing of reporters' cameras, the sight of policemen holding back the mob, signs condemning her, and grown men and women pouring curses on her small head. How she endured all of that 
while walking resolutely up the steps of the all-white elementary school. And then, how at the top of the steps, she turned and prayed for those who hated her before entering the building. At the tender age of six, Naomi's eyes were open to the reality of human bigotry, cruelty, segregation, and hurt. But they were also open to something even more powerful. On the last night of that traumatic, traumatic week, Wendy stopped by Naomi's room to tuck her into bed, and Naomi's eyes were closed. At first, Wendy thought she was sleeping. But as she went to leave, Naomi opened her eyes and said, do you know what I'm doing, Mommy? No, what are you doing, Wendy asked. I'm praying for Dr. King and for Ruby Bridges and for all the mean people in the world. That's what Ruby Bridges did. And that's how come she was so brave. Jesus says, come and see and opens his disciples' eyes to the worst that people can do to one another. He shows them bigotry and apathy and self-righteousness and the utter cruelty of the cross. But he also shows them that the cross is not the end of the story. The gospel ends not in death, but in resurrection. Human cruelty is not the last word. The last word is the powerful, healing, forgiving word of God's love. And when the resurrected Jesus meets Mary weeping at the tomb, he says to her, who are you looking for? Bringing us back to the very beginning of our call. And as we look upon the man who has risen victorious over the worst that the world could do to him, we know this, this is what we were looking for. The risen Christ is who we are looking for. This power to sustain life in the midst of death and hope when we are tempted to despair, this is what we are looking for. Naomi couldn't understand the power of faith until she had first confronted and understood the power of cruelty. And our eyes can't be open to the true salvation of God's persistent, triumphant love if we close our eyes to the suffering that makes that salvation necessary a savior who brings wealth and prosperity to comfortable people is not much of a savior. But a savior who walks right into the midst of our suffering to embrace withered flesh and bring healing to broken hearts, to sit in prison cells, bringing a word of hope to the prisoner, to hold the hand of a dying woman to bring her comfort, to teach us the courage to forgive, and the power of prayer in the face of our enemies, that is true salvation. Here is a Savior who can turn our, ears, our tears into laughter, who can lift us when we have fallen, who can heal us when we have been broken into pieces, who has taken on the worst that life can give us in order to show us the best of life, when we walk with the one who saves us. What are you looking for? Christ holds out his hand to you and he says, come and see. Let us bow our heads in prayer. God, give us the courage to open our eyes to the suffering of others, the cruelty of the world, all of the things that are broken and in need of healing, so that knowing the worst that the world can do, we will be able to stand with you, take your hand, and trust in the best that you promise, in the new life that you offer, and we can be healed. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
please stand for the benediction. And now deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the singing brook to you, deep peace of gentle hearts to you, deep peace of the light of the world to you. Go in peace, now and forever. Amen.